Hi. So I'm Pavel Matsenauer and I'm a software engineer at NXP, soft, uh, and NXP Semiconductors. And together with David Steele from Arcturus Networks, we are going to talk about Armanan and its deployment in the smart city. So uh, in the first part of the presentation, I'm going to introduce Armanan, talk about the Python interface, which was introduced in the May release, and then dive into backends, which are a mechanism which connects Armanan to the underlying hardware. Afterwards, David is going to take over and talk about uh, the smart city use case and how they designed their vision pipeline in Arcturus Networks. So, uh, what's Armanan? So, Armanan is a middleware inference engine for machine learning on the edge. Uh, I would like to stress the word middleware here because on the input it takes models from popular frameworks such as TensorFlow, TensorFlow Lite, uh, Cafe, ONNX, and it mostly delegates uh, these models to the underlying hardware, typically uh, th either directly through a driver or it can be basically any software like a compute engine. Uh, an example of a compute engine which is used in ArmNN is the ARM Compute Library, which accelerates accelerates um, the models either uh, through Neon for Cortex A processors or through OpenCL for uh, Mali GPUs. Or it can also accelerate your neural network uh, using uh, the Ethos and NPU. Or uh, if you have some custom hardware available on, on your machine, you can use a third party driver. So uh, more, more about the Armanen project. So uh, around two years ago, uh, the Armanen project was uh, donated as open source to the Artificial Intelligence Initiative, uh, Linaro Artificial Intelligence uh, Initiative, and currently it is maintained by it. Uh, Still, uh, ARM is the main developer here, but community and NXP as well is participating. And uh, you can track most of the releases on GitHub. Uh, Armanen is released quarterly, and uh, the releases they are synchronized together with the ARM compute library. As I mentioned, ARM compute library is uh, the compute engine for uh, Armanen. Uh, if you would like to contribute, or participate more on the development, uh, you can use uh, the ML platform org, uh, which is a website maintained by Linaro. So you can, uh, you can contribute there or uh, sign up for the mailing list. So uh, now more about PyRMNN, which is the code name for the Python interface, which was introduced in the May release of uh, RMNN. So uh, basically, uh, PyRMNN doesn't implement any additional compute or computational kernels. Uh, it only implements a few helper and convenience functions, additionally to most of the C++ API. And uh, it's basically just a uh, Python wrapper. Uh, it's available integrated into the whole uh, ARMNN uh, CMake system. So when you are building uh, your ARMNN, uh, you specify all the CMake variables and it runs the build. Uh, it creates the libraries, it creates uh, the binaries. And uh, if you enabled PyRMNN as well, it will build either, uh, either the Python source package or the Python binary package. Uh, if you need to use a, leg a legacy version of RMNN, you also have that option. Uh, those are available on the NXP Micro GitHub as well uh, for the 1908, 11, and 2002 releases. And uh, what you actually need to do there is to provide the RMNN uh, libraries and header files pre-compiled, and it's a standalone project which uh, builds the wrappers separately. 
So, uh, a little bit more about those who are interested in Python wrapping. So, uh, SWIC, which is a project which, here, which is here already for ages, uh, was used for that. It's available for a large number of languages, Python, JavaScript, uh, Perl, PHP, I think Ruby as well. And basically what it does is that uh, you provide the header files of your favorite C, C++ library and it generates a Python interface, which is basically the same as the C++ interface. Uh, you need to do two things there. Uh, the first thing is uh, you need to modify setup.py slightly. Setup.py is the Python file uh, which is used by setup tools to generate your Python packages. And then you need to write your SWIC templates. Uh, SWIC uses a, uh, a custom language for that, uh, which is pretty simple to understand. And what you do there uh, in those templates is that you expose the, you or you define uh, what C++ API you want to expose uh, to the uh, to the user or to Swig in this case. Uh, how to compile it using CMake? So uh, basically uh, it's part of the standard uh, Armanen build. Armanen uses CMake as its build system and you just set uh, a variable either for the real package, the binary package, or for the source package. Uh, if you are feeling a bit more hacky, uh, you can also use the scripts directly in the Armanen repository. And uh, what this uh, produces is uh, it either produces the binary package, the wheel, uh, which you can see uh, has a name like CP37, CP37M, etc. So that it's uh, that means that it's platform dependent. It's uh, cross compiled or uh, compiled directly for your architecture, or you can use the source package, which you then uh, use, for example, on uh, on your board. And uh, if you have a compiler like GCC available there, uh, it compiles directly on your board. Um, it's uh, PyArmen is not available as of right now, it's not available through PyPy, so uh, through your favorite pip install, name of the module, uh, Python package system. So, uh, a little bit about PyArmen and how to use it. So. Uh, uh, don't be scared too much, uh, it's code, but uh, this is standard Python. So it starts off with uh, the standard imports. You can import your uh, math library, NumPy, for example, OpenCV for loading images, and then uh, PyArmanen as well. Uh, afterwards, you need to choose uh, the Armanen parser. So uh, that specifies what framework you are actually using or you used to build your model. So here I'm using TensorFlow Lite. So I have my uh, TensorFlow Lite model already prepared. I load it. And uh, then, uh, the import then there is some initialization. And the important part are the, uh, is the preferred backends variable there. So uh, remember that line. There is GPU, ACC, CPU, ACC, and CPU ref specified there. So those are actually uh, names of Armen and backends. So uh, remember those names because I'm going to talk about those a little later. Afterwards, there is the optimize and load network call. So that loads the network into the runtime and optimizes the neural neural network model. And then afterwards, well, uh, you have to use something like OpenCV to load your image. You specify the inputs. So you bind the image to the input tensors. Uh, you need to specify the outputs. So, um, yep, specify the outputs, that's it. And afterwards, uh, you run inference. So uh, for that, you have the NQ workload function, uh, which you then call and uh, it produces the output in, well, uh, wherever you specified your output. And afterwards, you can process it. Uh, the advantage of Python is that it's 
really simple to use. You can use all kinds of additional convenience libraries available uh, on your board if you have Python there. And it's uh, much more comfortable to work with than actually to use C++ and compile it whenever you uh, make some change. So uh, as an example here, and an example which is also available in the Armenian repository, uh, this produces a tensor with a classic uh, something called softmax output, uh, which produces the uh, most uh, probable, probable labels. And the input here was a cat. Uh, the output you can see is a most probably a tabby. So based on wiki, it's an cat with an M on its forehead. So uh, now uh, remember those uh, CPU ACC and uh, those backends. So uh, I'm going to talk about backends now. Uh, so what's an uh, what's an Armen and backend? Ar and backend is an abstraction layer. Basically, it's an interface which connects your model or your graph definition to the underlying hardware. So uh, either it can be a uh, directly a driver or it can be some compute engine. But basically, you can connect it to any software available or any library. Uh, in Armen, uh, there are uh, Typically, uh, there are four or four, three, let's say three backends available. Here, I'm not going to count in the NPU. Um, you have the OpenCL backend, which is available through uh, ARM Compute Library, uh, which uses OpenCL. So it can not only be used on the Mali GPU, but it can be used on any hardware which uh, has OpenCL enabled. And it's accelerated through uh, through OpenCL and uh, I mean uh, th through ACL and it, uh, ACL is pretty heavily optimized. So, uh, well, it's a nice software to use. Uh, then uh, you have the Neon backend, which uh, which is optimized for the Cortex A CPUs, and you you also have the Reference backend, which is used just for testing or it can be the last fallback if some of uh, some of the layers are not supported in your uh, in your model additionally it's pretty uh, pretty easy to implement your custom backend so uh, for example uh, at nxp uh, we have our uh, our npus which use a custom backend for acceleration uh, backends can be either uh, either linked statically or dynamically, and yeah, that's about it. Uh, so uh, now for the uh, last slide about uh, backends, there there is a nice example how they work, and it's called uh, hybrid execution. Uh, as I mentioned, you can specify. Uh, multiple backends. So here as an example, I will uh, give the NXP IDOTAMX8 backend and also the ARM Neon backend. So uh, in our use case here, uh, here uh, the NXP backend only supports convolution. Uh, so it will run all the convolution layers on that backend. And uh, based on how you define the backends which you want it, uh, want it to uh, use, uh, it will delegate the unsupported layers, which in this case would be the average pooling layer and the fully connected layer. It will delegate those to another, uh, another backend which uh, enables those. Uh, this is all done uh, internally in the optimized function. So basically, as a user, you just specify the backends, and it, it, it the software would automatically optimize uh, the whole the whole runtime. Uh, to achieve this it, uh, during uh, during the optimized call, it basically creates workloads uh, for every layer, and uh, afterwards. Basically, just the workloads are executed during runtime. Uh, just a little intro how to implement it. But, uh, it's pretty simple. 
how to implement your own backend. You just need to implement all the interfaces. You need to implement all the workloads, unit tests, write make files, and that's it. So on the right, you can see you've got a folder with unit tests. You've got a folder with uh, workloads, for example, for convolution, fully connected layer, pooling layer, etc. And then you need to implement a few interfaces, which uh, uh, yeah, you just need to implement those few interfaces together with make files. So hopefully that wasn't uh, too too geeky. And I am going to hand over now to David Steele from Actors Networks, uh, who is going to talk about more about real world examples and the use cases in uh, in the smart city. Thanks, Pavel. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, David Steele from Arcturus. Uh, we specialize in edge AI and vision solutions using ARM A-class CPUs, GPUs, and NPUs. So now that we understand the role of ARM and N in an edge system and we know how we can implement it, what I'm going to do during my portion of the session is pull the lens back slightly and look at how we can use ARM and N as our inference engine in a real world application. Let's take a smart city example uh, in public transportation. Public transportation offers us good use cases that really emphasize the benefit of edge processing. So why do we want to process at the edge? Uh, well, simply put, the edge is where the data source is and where the actions need to take place. This makes edge processing inherently more efficient and lower latency than shipping data to a central location for processing and then waiting for a result. On top of this, there could be a number of other reasons, including privacy concerns, infrastructure and operational costs and complexities. And although I have a picture of a subway platform here, consider that there is over 65,000 public buses on US roads today. If you can imagine the bill you would get from continuously streaming video data over LTE from each of them every day, all day, just to perform some relatively simple analytics, it just doesn't make sense. OK, so that's a quick overview of why we want to do processing at the edge. But what is it that we want to know? Uh, if we take this busy subway platform here as an example, there's probably a lot of things we might want to know. Uh, for example, we might want to know how many people are on the platform, where they're located. Are they too close to the edge of the platform, or have they crossed over onto track level? We might also want to detect packages, bags, or luggage that get left behind and identify who owns them. And of course, uh, in today's climate, uh, we might want to detect density and proximity to aid in things like social distancing. And we can do all of these things, but the question is, you know, where do we start? The first step is to really think about our vision pipeline as a whole. And we need to remember that inference is only one aspect of it. In addition to inference, we're going to need to rely on algorithms to help us perform tasks such as motion tracking. We're going to need to apply heuristics to create logical rules such as actions based on time of day. And we're also going to need to gather data from our scene over a period of time to look for patterns, anomalies, or strange behavior. And of course, we're going to want to output our result of our, uh, of our vision pipeline in some form of representation to show what the vision pipeline sees and provide some form of event notification as well. In addition to each stage of our pipeline, we also need to consider carefully the overall architecture of it. Our application, after all, is real time and it uses time sensitive video frame data. Inducing latency into our system or losing synchronization not only leads to a bad user experience, but it can also lead to things like incorrect bounding box data being provided to another pipeline node, resulting in overall poor performance. And finally, we also need to think about serviceability and flexibility. For example, if we want to update our detection model, why do we need to update our whole pipeline? Or if we want to change a detection characteristic, how can we do this easily at runtime? So now that we generally understand the pipeline stages and our design considerations, we can start to formulate this into an architecture. And there are a lot of ways we could go about this. But if we think of the pipeline as a collection of nodes, and each node is its own microservice, then this approach has some benefits. For example, we can apply some cloud native methodologies. We could containerize our nodes and, nodes, and this can help us meet our serviceability objectives by allowing us to fairly easily upgrade pipeline components at the node level. 
We can efficiently serialize and deserialize video frame data using flat buffers. And we can even use something like a fairly standard message passing library to handle metadata and synchronization between each node. An approach like this gives us a lot of flexibility. It provides a method for us to reconfigure nodes. And this is quite important because it means that we're not limited to doing all the processing locally. For example, if our workload changes, then we can add a node or offload a node to another physical resource to make the architecture more distributed. Using this approach, we can also orchestrate the pipeline at runtime, which makes it uh, highly dynamic and easily configurable. Ultimately, the uh, pipeline architecture we choose will have the biggest impact in our latency synchronization, flexibility, serviceability, design considerations. But the one design consideration we haven't talked about yet is efficiency. And this requires us to look closely at detection models. In our smart city application, what we're trying to achieve with our inference model is to detect and classify objects. And there are lots of models that do this with a range of characteristics, different input image sizes, pre-trained in different data sets, supporting different model precisions with different accuracies, different inference engine support and different and even different hardware backends. Ultimately though, if we look at the model in isolation, our design consideration needs to meet our real-time edge processing requirements. And this does help us narrow down the field significantly. Models like MobileNet, for example, were purpose-built for edge processing. And these models, when combined with a detection head, such as SSD, make it possible to achieve detection and classification in one forward pass of the network. And it's this efficiency that makes it possible for us to process video at, in real time at the edge, even on raw CPU cores without dedicated AI hardware acceleration. Now, of course, Using models like MobileNet, there's always a trade-off. In this case, we are trading off speed for accuracy, particularly when it comes to smaller objects. But for our use case, accuracy is actually less of a concern. What we need to do is we need to quickly detect people in real time. And for us, that requires squeezing out every frame per second we can, even if we get a couple of false positives or negatives along the way. So now that we've talked about the type of model we need, let's talk about how we can achieve it with the best possible performance. Pavel in his portion of the presentation referenced different backends that are supported under ARM and N, and we can look at how these affect performance. And bear in mind, we're talking inference here. So these charts, uh, with these charts, the lower number is better. So the chart on the left is uh, comparing ARM and N CPU ref versus CPU ACC, CPU accelerated backends. CPU ref is an example backend provided by ARM. It's not optimized. It's intended for developers to help build their own more optimized backends or applications. It's written in C++ and it supports a basic set of primitives without multi-threading and doesn't take advantage of the NEON single instruction multiple data acceleration offered by the core. So in a nutshell, CPU ref is intended to be a reference implementation, not a performance reference or a production backend. But it does provide a point of comparison to illustrate the improvement that can be achieved when we do optimize the backend for the hardware we are running it on. And this takes us to CPU ACC, which improves our inference time from about 120 seconds down to 211 milliseconds, just by taking advantage of the multi-core support and the NEON acceleration that allows us to do that multiple matrix math operations in one clock cycle. Now, to put this in more of a real world context, by using CPU ACC, we're able to achieve about four frames per second, which is to say not bad just for making good use of the facilities that already exist on the processor. Uh, incidentally, I, I should point out that we tend to reference MobileNet v2 a lot in this presentation for comparisons, and that's simply just because it's very broadly supported. But even performance with MobileNet v3 small can achieve even, even a higher frame rate, so we can get about eight frames per second using uh, CPU ACC. Now, another uh, reference point we can use is to compare ARM and N with OpenCV 4.2.0, which is the chart on the right. Now, in a way, this is a more fair comparison in that CPU ACC and OpenCV both make good use of the cores available, the threading and the OS, with some slight differences in model format. But this gives us a clearer picture of how optimized ARM and N is. But if we're looking for performance, we can probably still do even better. So this chart illustrates the gains we can achieve when we start to optimize the model by using quantization. In this example, we're using MobileNet v2 running on CPU ACC using floating point 32. 
Then in the next uh, next part of the chart, we quantize the model to use int 8 and run it again on CPU ACC, getting about a 50% performance improvement. Then finally, in the third uh, column, we change the back end to use NPU acceleration, still running our quantized int 8 model. And in this case, we're seeing an overall, an overall uh, inference time drop from about 211 milliseconds to 25 milliseconds. And to put this in more practical terms, that increased our performance from four frame, frames per second to eight frames per second to 40 frames per second. Now, interestingly enough, what's not shown in the slide is what happens when your model is not optimized for the hardware. For example, if we were to run a non-quantized model on the NPU, our performance is going to go way the other way. Instead of 25 milliseconds, we're going to get performance in the range of three seconds, which would be worse than if we just ran it on the raw cores. So the key message here is that it's important to ensure, number one, that you're using the correct backend support, that the model you're using is optimized for the hardware that you're running it on, whether that be CPU, GPU, or NPU. And if you recall from Pavel's portion of the presentation, make sure you validate your choices in your backend preference list as well. Okay, so now that we've got our pipeline architecture and we can detect uh, people and objects, we can start to do some fun stuff. We can start to work on understanding the relationships between objects in the time or space domain. In our use case, the simplest starting point is to identify where people are located on the subway platform. And to do this, we need to understand 3D space, or at least have a representation in 2D or 3D space. And we can do this by establishing boundaries or zones in the field of view, and then using the bounding box coordinates from the detection output combined with the class data to locate where a person appears. In this particular example, we're breaking the platform down into three zones. We have a red highlighted exclusion zone, which is close to the edge of the platform and over the tracks. Then we have a yellow warning zone and a green inclusion zone. And we just present the location information, how many people are in each area on a simple web interface. While this is uh, pretty straightforward, it gives us the basis to add additional heuristics. Uh, for example, in this image, if we know the size of the tiles used on the floor, then we can detect how close people are to each other. And we can use this proximity information to help maintain social distancing or even control the flow of people where they wait. And we can do this all using existing 2D cameras that are already installed. Anyway, all this is good and we're now well into building our application. But uh, what if we wanted to do something a little bit more complex? What if we wanted to identify that someone has left a bag on the subway platform? Now, to accomplish this, we need to identify the bag and its owner and then introduce tracking and re-identification to recognize that we get them again in future frames. Now, the simplest form of tracking is motion model tracking. And this is where we use object velocity to create a prediction envelope. And then if a new detection fits within this envelope, we can assume it's the same object identity, or if it doesn't, then we create a new identity. Now this approach is fairly lightweight, but it does have limitations. Number one, it's limited to fixed velocity objects only. Number two, it needs reliable and continuous detection. In other words, an object really needs to remain in the field of view. And then once a track is lost, there's really no way to recover it. So the obvious question is, how can we make this more robust? Well, we can enhance motion model tracking by adding a visual description of each detection and then compare these descriptions to determine when or where the same object appears in the future. Now, this method works in a similar sort of way to facial recognition as both approaches rely on embedding networks that create feature, vector, feature, pardon me, that create feature vectors to describe visual appearance. Once we have our feature vector, then we can measure the distance between pairs of images, either using Euclidean distance or cosine similarity. The chart in the top right uh, illustrates comparing the distance between dissimilar pairs of people, and the chart on the bottom is comparing pairs of the same person. And using this data, we can see that the distance between dissimilar pairs is somewhere in a median range of 1.1 to 1.5 compared with 0.3 to 0.7 where, when we're comparing pairs of the same person. So based on this, we know that we have a fairly deterministic method to distinguish what same and different identities are. And so by adding this visual appearance embedding, this will help us to overcome the limitations of motion model tracking, and it will allow us to re-identify objects irrespective of time and space. 
But uh, of course, as with everything, it also has its cost. It requires us to generate an embedding for every object detection. Thus, more detections, more expensive it's going to be. It also requires us to have a second network to process the embeddings in addition to our detection and classification network. Now, fortunately for us, we can leverage our pipeline architecture to help us accommodate the additional workload. We can add a node in our pipeline and process this on hardware resource that's optimal for this task. And this is a really good approach for us today, but there's also some really interesting emerging solutions to this problem for tomorrow. And there's two areas uh, in, per in particular that we're quite excited about at Arcturus. Um, one, for example, is a new generation of networks that's emerging, uh, such as CenterNet. And these networks can not only detect and classify, but they can also create the embedding all in one forward pass, which eliminates the workload variability associated with having to process an num unknown number of uh, detections in the frame, or even the overhead of supporting two networks. And there's also new dedicated re-ID networks such as OSNet AIN that are demonstrating very good promise uh, as well. So hopefully I've given you some good insights on how ARM and N can be used in a real world application and also how it fits well in, in, into a well-designed pipeline architecture for your detection workflow. Hopefully I've also illustrated the importance of considering algorithms and data analysis in addition to inference as part of your overall design. Now, unfortunately, we sort of ran out of time to present the live part of the demo in this, uh, in this session, but we do have a link to the live demo, which you can reference after this presentation, and the link is on this slide. So on behalf of Pavel and NXP and myself, David Steele at Arcturus, uh, I wanna thank you for uh, joining us today.